your name. There's no other name that's worthy, is it? He's the only one, the only one. Listen, I am so glad that you are here this morning. Um, this morning, I hope that you are ready um, for Bible drill, because um, we're going to be uh, hitting about, mm, I think, about 11 different passages of Scripture. So um, you won't be able to sleep this morning. You've got to turn pages, okay? Um, so um, I want you to turn the pages. I want you to look for it yourself. And just to be sure, i let you know, I wanted to be involved with that with you today, so I brought my Bible instead of my tablet. And um, now I'll be turning pages just like you. I cheated a little bit, though. I have a marked. <laughs> so um, I went ahead and marked them so I'd get there a little quicker. But we're going to be turning a lot of pages today. Why are we going to be turning a lot of pages? Well, we're going to be turning a lot of pages because there's a lot of passages that I want us to cover today. Why? Why, preacher, do you want to cover a whole bunch of passages? Don't you usually just pick, uh, you know, a small one passage and one little verse and kind of that's what we cover? Well, yeah, usually that's where I'm led, but not today. <laughs> today it's a little different. Today I wanted to talk to you about that word all and then a phrase all things. Now I already gave you the information that how many times this phrase occurs in the Bible. Now I told them it was 122. What does it say on the screen? See, I even remembered it wrong. 221 times that that passage, that phrase occurs in Scripture. 221 times. So I think it's important. You know, usually if you repeat something that many times, it's important. It's something we need to know. So all things is something that we want to talk about today. And all of the passages that we will be going through today are going to be talking about that. And we're going to be looking at the things, all the things that God gives us. We're going to be looking at how God provides for us in so many different ways. And he provides all. He doesn't only provide some. He provides all. And so this morning I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we're going to be looking at verse 17 and 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to be looking at 17 and 18. You know, I want to pause right here. I just feel like we need to pray over this today. And so I want to have a prayer right now. Let's pray. Father, we do come to you today. And Father, we know there's a lot of passages that we're going to be flipping through today. But God, you provided every one. God, we have a Bible here with 66 books. Father, it's a lot of words, a lot of things that we read. And Father, everything that we read is important. Every part of this Bible is important. Today as we go through these passages, help us to just grasp how complete your work is and how complete what you have given us is. That Father, there's not a time when you've left us all on our own. But God, you have given us all things and we're thankful for that. Today we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now, all these things are from God, who reconciled to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. All these things. So we look at this and we realize that all these things it's talking about is this new source of power, this new creation. Everything that God has given the new creation is the source for us. Everything that has happened, all these new things are God's source. They come from God. Prior to that person becoming a new creation, that person walked apart from God. When they walked apart from God, their source was not God. I want to say that again. We have a tendency to say, and it's true, that God created all. However, when a person walks apart from God, and they do until the moment that they give their life to Him, then the source of everything they have is not of God, but it's of the world or of the devil. And so until that person becomes a new creation in Christ, God is not the source 
of all things for them. But once they do, and they become a new creation in Christ, then God is the source that provides all things for them. They're a new creation. They're no longer the same. They're not walking the same. They don't draw from the same source. They're a brand new creation. And because they're a brand new creation, then now everything they get is from God. And so when we think about this and we understand that God is the source of all these things, God is the one that provides it all, then why do we worry about the things that we don't control? Why do we worry about how are we going to do this or where are we going to get that or what's the next day going to bring? God is the source of all. He's the source that we tap into. He's the one that when we come to know him, he is the source of all things. And so we look to him for all things. We have a tendency to look for him for some things. But we should be looking to him for all things because that's what he provides for us. God is the source. Now, I want you to turn with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 21. And it says this, So then, let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you. Let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you. They belong to who? God. All things belong to God. And so if all things belong to God, then how is it that a man might boast in his own power? How is it that a man might say, I am the source of that. I am the power of that. I am the one that accomplished that. All things belong to God. Every single thing. You know, sometimes people have a tendency to, uh, they make a lot of money and so they come and they pull the money out of their pocket and they, they show it off as if, you know, this is what I'm doing. I'm so good and I'm giving this. Well, guess where you got that money? From God. <laughs> Pardon me. God gave all things. All things belong to God. We think we're doing God such a favor by giving him money back at church on Sunday and Wednesday and whenever we give to him, we think we're doing such a favor. It was his to start with. It was his to start with. He allowed you to hold on to it, to use it in this world, and to give back to him is something we should do because all things belong to God. God is the object of the believer's power. God is the object of the believer's power. Now what do I mean by that? I said he's the object. He is the thing that provides the power. He is the thing that we look to in order to have power. Well, what are you talking about a believer's power, pastor? A believer's power over Satan. A believer's power over this world. A believer's power because we have power. We're not weak although we act like it. We're not weak. God is the object of that power. That's where it comes from. He is the one we look to to give us the power we need. He has already told us that he will provide what we need when we need it. He will give us the thing to say when we need to know it. He will provide that. He is the object of our power. He is the one that's there. So he is the source. He's also the object of, of believer's power, but he's also our purpose. Again, what do I mean by that? God's our purpose. Well, what else is your purpose for living? What else is our purpose for living? We look at ourselves and we think our purpose is to accumulate er earthly things and have a bank account and a savings account and have all the, the stuff we want. Our purpose is to be able to do what we feel like we want to do to satisfy our own desires. That's not our purpose. God created us. He created us for a purpose to be with him in worship. And then he gave us the instructions. What? Go and tell. Our purpose is for God. He is our purpose. What is our purpose? There's many people that ask that question. Why am I here? Why am I here? Why did I get born into this world? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Well, it's very simple. God, that's your purpose. 
Now, God has a purpose for each individual life, and he may use you to do certain things. For some, he may give you a purpose of glorifying him with beautiful music. For some, he may give you a purpose of being a leader in the community. For some, he may give you a purpose of being a leader in the family or being uh, a good a uh, person that goes and tells others about God. Whatever it is, he gives us that. But our purpose is him. We have no other real purpose of being here. The only other thing that we could have out of being here is against God, and that's selfishness. That's the only other purpose we would have. Why would we be here? We wonder sometimes, why does God allow some person to only live two years of life? and turn around and let someone else live 108? Why does he allow that big difference and change? What is it that he's doing with that life? I can't tell you the full answer of that. I can tell you he has a purpose for every single one. He's our purpose. He, the reason we're here is because of him. And when we have filled the purpose that he has given us, then it's time to come home. And I think of it like this sometimes. Some of us just accomplish that quicker than others. Some of us go out of this world a little sooner than others. Some of us maybe accomplish that quicker. I don't know exactly why God lets some people live so long and some not so long. I don't know all those things, but I do know that our purpose, our main purpose in life is God. That's what we need to glorify. That's what we need to be seeking. That's what we need to be looking for every single day is what God wants us to do. What is it that God wants us to do? He said, let no man boast in his own strength, but all things belong to you. Everything. So God is our purpose. Look with me to Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. And it says this. 8.28 says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. And many of us stop there. Oh, God causes all things to work together for good. Stop. But the passage doesn't stop there. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God. He causes it. We don't cause it, he causes it. We wonder, why is it that I'm going through these hard times? God causes all things to work together for good to those who love the Lord. There's something that's going to come out of that. We don't know what it is. We don't know why. We don't understand. But if we trust that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love the Lord, then we know he's going to bring us through whatever it is. He's going to use what we're going through. He's going to be, there's going to be something that comes out of that because he is God of all. All things, all people, all situations, all heartache. He's, he is God of all those things. Even when we have trouble in this world, he told us we would. He said, you will have trouble in this world. But he will never leave us or forsake us. He is with us always. He is God of all, and he causes all things to work together for good for those who love the Lord. They're together for good so that we might fulfill his purpose, because God is our purpose. So as we go through this life again, he didn't make all things work together for good so that we would be happy. He didn't make all things work together for good so that we might boast that, hey, it's all good. He made all things work together for good for his purpose, and we look to him for his purpose because he is our purpose. And so when we look at all of this and we see all things work together for good, we want to say all things, but we don't want any of this negative stuff. We don't want any of these hard times. We don't want any of this stuff that is uncertainty and all of those things. Well, I agree with that. I don't want any of it either. However, God said we will have trouble in this world. If his own son had trouble in this world, don't you think we will? And so God said we would, but all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. God provides that. Look with me to uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 22. And it says this. It says... 
And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. All things are under Christ's feet. God put all things under his son Christ. Jesus Christ, he put all things under him. That means he is in charge of all things in this world. God gave every bit of that to Jesus to be all things would be in subjection to him. All things will be under his control. All things will be under his rule. He is the one that's in charge. We forget about it. And sometimes we think we're in charge. Sometimes we think the world's in charge. Sometimes we look at all of the stuff that goes on and we say, well, nothing we can do. We just have to live with it. We just have to be that way. Okay, but have you prayed about it? Have you shared the gospel with someone? Have you talked to somebody about it? Have you prayed for the ones who are leading in that direction? Have you done any of that? You see, if everything is under the subjection of Christ, then that means that all things are under him. All things. Now, that doesn't mean that all people are going to follow, but all things are under his control. We fret and wring our hands and, and say, oh, I don't know what we're going to do about elections every time we have an election. But the scripture tells us clearly that no one's given that authority except through Christ. He's the one that has the authority to give. And if he gives them that authority, there's a reason. They're, all things are under his subjection. So should we pray for the people that are totally against what we think is right? Absolutely. Absolutely. We should be praying even harder for them than the ones that we think we agree with. Why should we be praying for them? Because they need to know Jesus. They need to know that. You see, if all things are under his subjection, everything is under his feet, all things are there, then he's in control. Even when we think the world has gone crazy and things are so far out of whack that we don't even know what's going to happen, he's still in control. We don't understand the plan. We haven't been given it yet. We don't understand it. But somehow we know he's in control. You remember in Scripture when uh, Gideon's army was small and yet they went against a much larger force. They had a big army but God cut it down. <laughs> he kept saying nope take these away, nope take these away until he had a very small force going up a very large force. And then they're told you know put a candle in a jar <laughs> and break the candle and make noise and do all of this. What is that going to do? You know, I mean, if I'm, if I'm one of those people following and I'm looking at Gideon going, man, you've lost your mind. What is that going to do? But you see, I didn't see the whole plan because <laughs> God knew the whole plan. And God's whole plan was to create confusion and chaos among those people that were the foes. And so he sent them out to do just exactly that. And something that we thought was the craziest plan in the world turned out to be the most impressive overthrowing of an army that we've ever seen and not even one sword was, was swung at that moment. It did get later, but at that moment no arrows were flung, no swords were swung, none of that happened, but they overcame them simply because they were confused. We didn't understand the plan. God did. All things are under subjection to Christ. We didn't understand. Why is it that way? Pray for the people. Pray for all people. And especially pray for those leaders that are in charge that we know are walking in a way that is not consistent in the belief of Jesus Christ. Pray for them. All things are under his feet. All things are under his control. But we need to pray for them. We need to continue to lift them up. Look at 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 27. And it says this, As for you, the anointing which you received from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things, and his, is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. You abide in him. His anointing teaches you about all things. His anointing. He's called you. 
You've heard the call. You've accepted the salvation that he gives. You have become his child. His anointing of you as his child teaches you all things. He's already taught you those things. You see, the problem is for many of us, instead of paying attention to those things, we try to look at it from a worldly perspective. We try to do things on our own strength. We try to do things. We say, well, we're not able to do that. I can tell you I have had many times when I've talked with someone about going out and sharing the gospel, and they have said, I can't do that. I just don't know how. I'm not good with that. I, I, I can't go and talk to somebody about that. Well, he has, his anointing has taught you all things. You know what to do. The problem is you're allowing fear to keep you from doing it. You're allowing fear to stop you from doing all these things. Satan has put a fear there that you won't overcome, that you don't even want to fight against. You've been given all things through this anointing of Jesus Christ. He's poured it on you. The filling of the Holy Spirit has given you all those things. Everything that you need. He has taught you everything that you need to know when you were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now sometimes we have to unlock that. It's there, but we, don't, we haven't paid attention to it. We haven't listened. We haven't done the reality is, if he's given us all things, he's anointed us with that, then why do we resist serving him in all ways? Why do we say, I'm not able? Moses gave every excuse in the book. I'm not your guy. I don't speak well. I don't, and he kept giving answers to all of that and provided for him. What makes you think that he won't do that for you? What makes you think that he won't provide for you all things that you need if you're simply willing to do what he's calling you to do. If he's already anointed you and taught all things into you, it's into a heart. Then it's there. It just means we've got to unlock it. And the way we do that is to be obedient in him. To be obedient in him. Listen, I'm telling you, there are times when I have spoken to someone, I didn't know what to say. I thought, how will I know how to talk to this person? But when I start talking to the person, God puts the words in my heart. They're there. I don't know. Sometimes I'm, I'm listening to it when I'm talking to you. I stand before you and I preach the word. God, I don't know how to bring that word. I preach the word, and as I'm preaching to you, I'm thinking, oh, that's really good, God. Because I didn't even write that. I didn't put it down. But God has given it, and it comes out. It's an amazing thing the way God uses us. He has already put those things into our heart. It is in every man innately put in every being the ability to see that God is real. <coughs> it's already been put. <coughs> Pardon me. In every person. It's already there. <coughs> the problem is that many people don't unlock it because they deny it. They just deny it. It's all around us, but yet they come up with some kind of denial and they turn away from it. All things have been anointed into you. You already know, and you should use this anointing as a privilege and tell people about Christ. It gives us privilege to talk to people. See, we can speak on his behalf because he's already given us what we need to know, and we should use that. We're going to to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13. I know that nobody probably knows this passage, um, Philippians 4.13. I hope that you all do. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Through his power, I can do all things. There's nothing I cannot do. Well, I take a little exception to that, preacher. I mean, you know, I, I can't sing, or I can't paint, or I can't do this, or I can't do that. Well, here's the point. Through God, you can do it all. Through God, you can do it all. 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. A friend of mine was in a church. A man came in, sat down, looked kind of confused. The pastor was talking. Didn't seem as if he understood what was being said. Another friend that was with him suddenly got up, didn't say a word, walked over and sat down with the man and began talking to him. But he began talking in a language that no one even knew he knew. And he spoke in a language, and the man that came sat down began to have tears in his eyes, and they prayed. He accepted Jesus. After the service was all over, my friend was talking to him about that. And he said, what was going on? And he said, well, I just went over and talked to the guy about Jesus because I could tell something was happening and he just needed to know right now. So I went to talk to him. And my friend said, what language is that you were speaking? He said, what are you talking about? He said, you were speaking some language that I've never heard. What language were you speaking? He said, I wasn't speaking any other language. I was just telling him what he needed to know. But the amazing thing was, as he was speaking, what was coming out was not at all what he thought he was saying. Turns out the man was a full-blooded Cherokee and didn't understand English. He went over and sat down with him, and he, as he spoke in English, it came out in Cherokee. And he understood what he needed to do when he gave his life to Christ. He never, he never had any idea that he even spoke that. He couldn't tell you that if you'd have asked him. But through God's power, he was able to speak to that man, and God turned those words into what that man could understand. And he got saved. I can do all things. There's not one thing that I cannot do. Not one thing. We limit ourselves. We say, I can't do that. I remember as a kid telling my parents, I can't do that. And they said, can't never could. <laughs> Nobody ever heard that, right? Can't never could. If you don't try, how are you going to know you can do that? They were usually right. But we as Christians do the same thing. I can't do that, God. I can do all things through Christ. And all means? There's no exceptions. I can do all things except. There's no except in that passage. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things. We need to hold on to that. Look with me to Matthew chapter 21 and verse 22. Matthew chapter 21 and verse 22. And all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. All things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. All things through prayer. Here's the problem. Why can I not do all things? Because I don't ask for all things through prayer. I don't believe it. I don't go to God and say, God, help me be able to do this thing. Whatever it is. God, I know you put on my heart that you want me to do this thing. Help me to do it. I can do all things through Christ. I need to ask for it. Through prayer. Every single thing. Through prayer. God placed it on your heart that it's something that you need, then pray about it. Now, I'm not standing up here today telling you this is a name it and claim it. God, I pray you send me a million dollars tomorrow and then go look in the mailbox. Now, he could do that. He could do that. But I'm not saying that. I'm saying that all things through prayer, meaning if God's put it on your heart to pray, then you're going to pray what he wants you to pray. And we need to pray about those things that we say we can't do so that we can do all things through Christ. Pray. The power of prayer. We talk about it all the time. But as a whole, 
believers across the world don't always believe in the power of prayer. Oh, we talk about it, I'm going to pray for them, and we throw up a half-hearted prayer on the way out the door, saying, man, that's sad. That's sad about them. We never believed God was going to answer the prayer. We threw it up because we said we would. We didn't believe it. Prayer, pouring out your heart in prayer, believing that God is going to answer that prayer. God gives all things through prayer. Now his answer may not look exactly like what we think it should. We might think that the person we're praying for should live to be 130 at least. That may not be God's answer. The person that we're praying to reach may not happen tomorrow. But more than likely, in days to come, God's going to answer that prayer because he said he would. Are we truly praying about that? Are we truly spending time in prayer knowing that it says all things through prayer? Are we really truly doing that? All things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. But when we toss up a half-hearted prayer and we don't really believe it, why would we expect God to answer it? Why? Look at Mark chapter 9, verse 21. Mark 9, 21, and he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood, wait a minute, what did I do there? Did I do the right one? Yes. Um, Twenty-one said, and he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. Verse 22 said, it's often thrown him into the fire and in the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. All things are possible to him who believes. All things are possible through faith. All things are possible through faith. Now I love what he said next in this passage. He said, he says, um, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. <laughs> I do believe, help my unbelief. In other words, right up until that moment, he didn't believe. <laughs> Now he says, I believe, help my unbelief. The things that I don't, that I haven't had that faith, help me with that. That's exactly what I think we all should be praying every day. I believe God, but help me where I fail in that. Help me where I fail to believe. Help me in my faith that I don't hold strong. Help me with that. All things are possible if I have that faith, but God, sometimes I don't have that faith. I don't know why I'm so weak in that. Help me in my unbelief. Because all things are possible. I know that. I know that. Maybe I've even seen that. But still, I have a problem. I struggle with that. I struggle with that. The thing is that we're human beings. And as human beings, we fail in a lot of ways. We struggle with that. But don't stop. Every day, that's a prayer we need to have. Help my unbelief. Help me to have a strong faith. Help me to know that all things are possible if I have that faith. Help me to remember that all means all. Help me with that. Because I fail in so many ways. And when God does help us out, look with me to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 20 says, Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God even the Father. Always giving thanks for all things. Now 
Maybe you're better than I am. Sometimes I have a hard time saying, God, thank you for the flat tire. Thank you for um, the car that won't start or the, uh, the something that happened that wasn't at all what I planned. Thank you for that. I struggle with that. But he says, give thanks for all things. That includes the things that you think are not good. Because he uses those things in ways we may not understand. I told you a few weeks ago, I was already upset because I was late leaving to head to Lake Charles. And I wanted to get there earlier before it got dark. And I was late, I was running behind leaving. And I left and I went down the road and I got to a spot where some, a terrible thunderstorm went through and that was bad enough, but I went a little further down the road and there are literally big pieces of trees blown across the road, cars on the side of the road that have been hit. There was debris everywhere, all this stuff that happened. If I'd have been 10 minutes earlier, I'd have probably been right in the midst of all that. When I saw that, you know what I said? Thank you, God, that I didn't end up in that. I was late and there was a reason. I didn't know why. I was upset about it. Thank God for all things. We don't know why. There are things that happen to us we don't understand, but God has a purpose and a plan, and He knows exactly what He's doing. Thank Him for all things. Thank Him for the good things. Thank Him for the other things in life that we're not so happy about. Thank Him that He's in control, because I want to tell you this. If God came to me today, and He said, Listen, George, I'm going to give you full control over everything. You got it. It's all yours. Now go and do well. It would not take me ten minutes to mess it all up. I promise you, it would be all messed up because it would not be done as God would do it, but it would be done as man does it, and that would be all messed up. So I thank God that he's in control and not me, and that he's the one that knows what's going on, even when I don't understand, that he's the one that uh, provides all things for us. Look with me to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. The end of all things is near. Anybody heard that recently? You heard people say this, this is we're getting in the end times. We're, we're living in the end times now. They're 100% right. We've been living in the end times since Jesus went back to heaven. Peter says, way back then, the end of all things is near. The word near maybe doesn't mean exactly what it means to us. How far is near? Well, God's time is not our time. God's ways are not our ways. We don't know how far near is. Near could be another million years. We don't know. Near could be tomorrow. We don't know what that means. But the end of all things, the end of all things on this side of heaven, the end of all things, talking about in this world, the end of all things, all the stuff that we're preparing for our future, the end is near, and that won't matter anymore. You see, this whole world is temporary. The whole world is temporary. And what we need to be laying up for our future is treasures in heaven. How do we lay up treasures in heaven? We follow God's purpose for all things. We seek His guidance for all things. We make Him the object of our worship for all things. We spend time in prayer about all things. Everything that we do needs to be given to God before we ever do it. The end is near. How near, based on our definition, I don't know. In fact, Scripture says no one knows except the Father. But the end of all things is near. And the question then becomes, are you ready for that? Are, the, are your family ready for that? Are your friends ready for that? Do they know about it at all? Look at Revelations chapter 21 and verse 7. Revelation 21 and verse 7. 
He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. King James Version actually says, will inherit all things. The overcomer will inherit all things, not of this world, but of heaven. The one who overcomes the world by receiving salvation in Jesus Christ will inherit all things. Remember, the end of all things is near. But the one who overcomes by accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior will inherit all things in heaven. All the good things, all the things that we will need for all eternity, we will inherit. But if we are apart from that, if we have never given our life to Christ, if we felt like all things are under our own control, we've done all things our way, we've done all things in a way that seemed pleasing to us and not to God, and we've never given our life to Christ, then listen to me. You're not an overcomer, meaning you will not inherit all things. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. It won't happen. Only an overcomer, one who's given their life to Christ, will that happen. I will be his God and he will be my son. Amen. I will be his God and he will be my son. That overcomer who inherited all things. He inherited a direct relationship with God, father and son meaning that he is heir to all things. Or she is heir to all things. Has that happened for you? Have you ever done that? Now listen, I want to make sure that you understand and you do not leave here today with any doubt in your mind. All means all. All means all. We've looked at a few passages today understanding how all things belong to God. Throughout all the scriptures, we see that God is God of all. So how many exceptions are there? Zero. All means all. God is God of all. Throughout everything we've looked at today, and that was only, I think, a dozen scriptures or, or 11 out of two hundred and. 21 uh, that say all things only just a very short few scriptures today to understand that God is God of all there's nothing out of his control there's nothing he cannot do there's nothing he can't save you from including yourself God is God of all that includes he's God of you you cannot be so far away from God that he can't save you Whatever you have done, whatever you have tried to put first and foremost in your life, you are not out of God's reach because he is God of all. So those who may say, well, God doesn't care about me because I've done so many terrible things. God is God of all, and he loves all. Scripture says he didn't come into the world to judge, but he came into the world to save it. That means to save the people. Followers of God receive all things. Let that soak in. Followers of God receive all things. There's nothing that is left out. We receive all things. If followers of God receive all things, that instead of walking around in a life of mediocrity, we need to understand all God gives. God gives us everything. If he's given us everything, why are we walking around as if we have nothing? Why are we walking around as if we're completely lost? Why are we walking around wringing our hands? There's nothing we can do. The world is greater than us. There's nothing we can do. Listen, God gave you all, including all power. God gave us everything. 
Use all God gives. We all have power, but we don't all use it. God gave us everything. Use it. Use it. Think about it like this. Someone gave you a brand new car. They said, listen, I came into some money, whatever the situation is, and I want to give you this brand new car. It's got the latest and greatest of everything. Man, it'll go from zero to 60 in 0.1 seconds. This thing has everything you could imagine. There's nothing on the road that can pass you. Nothing that's better than this car. It is the top of the line, and I'm giving it to you. We're not going to park it in the garage and leave it there. We're not going to put it out of sight and go, I'm sure glad that they gave me that car. Let's put it in the, in the garage and not drive it. The first thing we're going to say, where's the keys? <laughs> I'm ready to go. I want to try it out. What God has given us is much greater than any car that anybody could give us. What God has given us is greater than anything in this world. And yet we keep it parked in the garage. God gave us all power. But instead we say, well, I know we have all the power, but I'm not going to use it. I, I just I feel better about just not saying too much. I feel better about not doing too much. I just want to ride the middle of the road. You ever seen anybody drive down the middle of the highway? Not for long because they're in an accident very soon. Driving down the middle of the road is no good for anybody. As a Christian, driving down the middle of the road is displeasing to God. He said, if you're lukewarm, meaning you're neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth, meaning I will vomit you out. You're not pleasing God. God gives us all power. We need to use it. Don't hold back. Now listen, I'm not talking about grabbing your Bible and running out and finding the first person you can and beating them upside the head with it. I'm saying take that step. And tell someone about Jesus. Take that step and live your life in a way that's pleasing to Him no matter what the world says. No matter what the world says. Live that life that's pleasing to Him. Be that example for others. Use that power. Even if they, Scripture says, even if they can kill the body, they can't kill the soul. There's nothing greater than God. And He has given us all things. Now here's the question I have for you today. Have you ever received all that God has to give? Have you ever received all that God has to give? Or are you still walking around in your own power? Are you still walking around thinking you're king of the world? Are you still walking around thinking, well, I'm not sure about all this. I don't really know what, what to do. What, what is the situation? Have you ever received all that God has to give? If you've given your life to Christ, you received it all immediately. Have you ever received that? The end of all things is near. Scripture said that. It didn't say it's near and it will happen in the year 2096. It didn't say when it would happen because only God knows when it will happen. Have you received all things that God has to give? If you received all things that God has to give, use them. If you haven't received them, then today I'd love to tell you how. I'd love to share with you how you can give your life to Christ and receive all that God has to give. He is God of all, and He loves all. And today, He's calling you. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today, and we are so thankful to know that you are God of all. There's not a single thing, not one tiny thing, that you are not God of. You are greater than anything 
there ever has been or ever will be. You're in control of all. You love all. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here today that has never given their life to you, that today, God, you would open their eyes that they would see that you do love all and your desire is that all would come to know you and that none would perish. Father, draw them to yourself today. Father, for those of us that know you, but Father, we're not using the power that you've given us, I pray that you help us to do just that. That you remind us that you are the source and the object of all. That Father, you have all power. You're all knowing. Father, everything about you is 100%. And that if we are all in your family, then Father, we need to do exactly what you've called us to do. God, today we give you the glory for it all. And we ask it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.